And so I've been asked to talk uh, about abdominal uh, trauma, but of course you can't be talking about just abdominal trauma. You gotta include the pelvic trauma with it. These are the, sorry. These are the objectives that uh, I was asked to talk about. Uh, basically, we hopefully by the end of the session, you'll be able to distinguish the types of abdominal trauma. You'll be able to evaluate patients with abdominal trauma utilizing the primary survey and the ABCDE system. Uh, you'll be able to predict potential traumatic injuries based on the mechanism of injury, the history, and the clinical presentation. We'll outline uh, relevant anatomy and differentiating it between blunt and penetrating injuries. We'll also list proper utilization of imaging modalities in abdominal trauma. I'll hopefully explain the appropriate uh, disposition of abdominal trauma patients based on their diagnosis. The idea is where are they gonna end up after your evaluation. And we will list the indications for emergency, emergent surgical intervention in abdominal trauma and propose appropriate management in penetrating and blunt abdominal trauma. So let's start. Of course, being surgeons, the most important uh, basic science we've ever had was uh, anatomy. And uh, people always uh, think of the abdomen as in the soft part. However, the real abdomen really extends all the way into the chest and all the way into the pelvis. So the real abdomen, I would like you to think about it, the anterior abdomen, the external landmarks would extend all the way to the fourth intercostal space. Uh, on the flank, uh, it also, as you can see, it extends all the way there. And uh, in the back, it's until the, uh, basically the tips of the scapula. Now, uh, we sometimes, I used to get calls from my residents saying that the patient was stabbed in the back. There is no such anatomical landmark as the back. There is the chest, which is above the tips of the scapula. There's the thoracoabdominal area, which is from the tips of the scapula to the costal margin. And then there is the abdomen until the, the, uh, the pelvic crest. So please, whenever you call your seniors, make sure that you do not say that someone is just stabbed in the back. So when should I suspect abdominal trauma and pelvic injury? Well, it depends on the mechanism, of course. And, uh, you know, uh, the mechanism dictates a lot about the pattern of injuries that you might be facing. The majority of the traumas that we tend to see in the GCC tend to be blunt from motor vehicle collisions, or we also see them sometimes with uh, occupational injuries. So it is important when you're getting the history from the paramedics is to know, for example, the speed that the car was going. Not really the exact speed, but was it a high uh, speed collision or was it a, a slow impact? Where was the point of impact? Was it head on? Was it T-boned? Was it hit on the patient's side? Did it hit on the driver's side? Was the patient a driver, a passenger? What happened to the people with him in the car? Is one of them dead? That would give you an idea of the strength of the impact. Was there a lot of intrusion from the impact and did it take a long time to take the patient out of the car? That can give you an uh, idea about the energy transferred into the patient himself. Was there any airbags deployed? Was he wearing a seat belt? Was he wearing a seat belt properly? Or was he wearing it Omani style with just the shoulder harness just so that the police would not uh, give him a, a ticket? Did they find the patient in the car or was he ejected out of the car? That really does make a difference. Now, less often we do get to see patients with uh, penetrating trauma and we'll be going more into detail, but it also makes a difference. What was the, the, uh, the weapon used? Was it a knife or was it a gunshot? How far was the gunshot from? And how many stabs or where were the locations of wounds uh, on the body? And least is the explosions, and people always tend to think of explosions as in, in wartime. And unfortunately, in our uh, uh, region, it is not uncommon that we might get to see patients with, uh, uh, who are victims of, uh, let's say, terrorist or war. However, more commonly, you might get to see it from occupational injuries where there might be an explosion at the site 
of work. So with blunt force trauma, which as I said, the most common uh, mechanism, the common injuries tend to be the spleen, followed by the liver, followed by the small bowel, followed by the pelvis. In penetrating trauma, any organ is really at risk. Of course, a stab is a low energy and it tends to cause lacerations. While gunshots, depends if it's from a shotgun or from a hunting rifle or from a, a, a pistol, for example. Um, with shotgun, you can really tell the distance that the, the, the guy was shot from by the pattern of the, uh, the pellets. If they are concentrated and next to each other, it tends to be from close range, which means it has penetrating potential. While if it is widespread, then you will find that most of these pellets are mostly in the subcutaneous or maybe in the muscular layer and have not penetrated the abdominal cavity. Now explosions, unfortunately, will involve all of the mechanisms. You will have the blunt uh, force where you know, heavy objects can actually hit the body or he might be thrown off and he might hit a structure. They will be the penetrating fragments that go into the body and the blast injury waves itself can cause injury, especially for hollow viscous organs. So how do I determine if there is an abdominal or pelvic injury? I don't know, should we open it up? Unfortunately, I can't see the chat. But I will assume that my colleague, Dr. Han al Khadi, did a good job when he gave you the talk about the ATLS principles. And therefore, we have to do the ABCs and the assessment really depends on physical examination and adjuncts of the primary survey. So physical examination, it's not rocket science, it's look, feel, and listen. And the adjuncts that we use to assess the abdominal or pelvic injuries is basically simple stuff. The pelvic x-ray, FAST, which is the focused assessment sonography for trauma. And these days it's more thought of as an extension of your hand, an extension of the physical examination. A test that we don't do that often is the diagnostic peritoneal lavage. However, you don't know where you're gonna be working. You might not be working in a tertiary hospital. You might be somewhere in the periphery and you do not have the facility of a CT scan. You do not have a facility of an ultrasound. Therefore, it is something that we do encourage, especially our surgical residents to learn. So they might, it might help them in their diagnosis. Every test has its, has been, has its benefits, but also has certain disadvantages. One thing I need to warn you is that as surgeons, we've always focused on physical examination and physical examination is important. However, um, you have to realize the limitations of your physical examination. Sorry, I got distracted there for a second. I, I was able to open the chat box, so I guess I can uh, see your comments right now. So if you know what are the limitations of your physical examination, you will be able to know when is it reliable and when isn't it not reliable. Things that will compromise your physical examination is alcohol and other drugs. And I would love to believe that in our regions we don't have this. However, all of us have worked in the emergency department on the weekends and we know that that is not true. More common is uh, brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. And a lot of our patients do not come with an isolated abdominal injury. They will be part of polytrauma and they will never have a GCS of 15. Injuries to the ribs, spine, and pelvis also might distract you or distract the pain. The patient is in so much pain because of his rib fractures, he might not be able to tell you that it is pain, uh, that he is in pain when you're palpating his abdomen. So remember, a missed abdominal injury can cause a pre preventable death. And also, you do not want to cause iatrogenic trauma by excessively repeating a pelvic stability test. This note is for the orthopedic surgeons in the audience. 
Uh, another adjunct is urinary catheter, and it's really not for urinary retention. I don't care if the patient's awake and he can pee on his own. The idea behind it is that it monitors the urine output. I can use it as a judge for my, the, the efficiency of my resuscitation. It is also diagnostic, and it decompresses the bladder and gets it out of my way in case I do a DPL. Be always careful of patients with pelvic fractures. They are at a high risk of bladder and urethral injuries. And in the picture, you can see a hematoma, which would be diagnostic of that. Uh, with urethral injuries, a posterior urethral injury usually happens with polytrauma patients, pelvic injuries, while an anterior urethral injury tends to happen from a direct injury to uh, the pelvic area, like a straddle impact. And it might be isolated. Another adjunct that we tend to forget is the gastric tube. It relieves distension. It decompresses the stomach before a DPL, which is a must. However, be careful not to insert it through the nose when you suspect that the patient has a basilar skull fracture, a facial fracture, unless you want the radiology department to be using that CT scan with the NG tube in the brain to teach the medical students what not to do. Always also be careful of semi-conscious patients because it might cause vomiting and might cause aspiration. What is important is that if your patient gets an endotracheal tube, you should really automatically follow it with an oral gastric tube. Other adjuncts are blood and urine. However, there is no mandatory blood test that you have to do before a laparotomy. We tell our residents the most important blood test is really the cross match. That is what I need before any of those other bottles to be filled. If you do have the luxury, fill the other bottles. However, I am not guided by the initial hemoglobin that the patient comes with. Every uh, female patient in her fertile uh, period uh, should be considered pregnant until proven otherwise, and therefore we usually send routinely a pregnancy test. The other tests are depending but they don't really uh, guide uh, my initial management, the alcohol and other drug tests. With the x-rays, it's not rocket science. It's the usual x-rays we have in primary survey, the AP chest and the AP pelvis, and we don't move the patient for that. Uh, with penetrating trauma, it's the AP chest with abdominal markers. It is important to really mark the wounds. We don't call them entry or exit wounds. To us, they're just wounds because we are not forensic scientists. Uh, the favorite adjunct of most uh, doctors is the CT scan. Uh, of course, for you to be able to send a patient to the CT scanner, they should be hemodynamically normal, or after resuscitation, they have become hemodynamically normal. This is a quick table just to give you the advantages and disadvantages of every, of uh, comparing the DPL with the FAST and the CT scan. Of course, we usually love the CT scan because it is quite sensitive and it is quite accurate. And it also gives me an idea of active extravasation of IV contrast, which gives me an idea that there is a bleeder that I can tackle later with angioembolization or surgery. With FAST, I tend to re reserve FAST really for the hemodynamically abnormal patients that can't go anywhere, and I need to make a decision whether he's going, I'm going to open the abdomen or I will open the chest. Uh, with FAST, the nice thing about it is that usually it does not really require a radiologist. We get trained to do it. I am not looking for renal cyst or liver cyst. My idea is not to quantify the amount of fluid, it is to say, is there fluid or no fluid? Quick question, uh, will you do DPL if you have the facilities for diagnostic laparoscopy? Well, uh, I'll be coming to diagnostic laparoscopy later. If I fail to answer it, please uh, remind me. Okay. So, so what do we do with a hemodynamically normal patient with a penetrating trauma? Well, it depends where is the penetrating trauma. And here, mostly we are talking about low, low energy injury. So I'm talking about stab wounds. So lower chest wounds, basically, 
You can either go with serial exams, you can do a thoracoscopy, laparoscopy, or a CT scan. The abdomen, you have to divide it. Anterior abdomen is different than the posterior abdomen. It's different from the flank. For you to understand what tests you will be doing, you really need to know the anatomy of the abdomen that the retroperitoneal structures will present differently than the, the peritoneal structures. And therefore, for the anterior abdominal stab wounds, you can go either with wound exploration, you can do DPL, you can do serial exams, and here, I do believe there is a big role for diagnostic laparoscopy, and I'll be coming to it, inshallah. In the back and flank, let's remember that a posterior penetration of the colon might be actually masked by a serial abdominal exam. And it will not be detected on a fast. E even DPL might not be able to detect it. Uh, my preference usually in a hemodynamically normal patient is to do a triple or double contrast CT scan so I can look uh, at the blood vessels, I can look at the colon, and depending on where the stab is, I might need to be able to see the duodenum or duodenum. I don't know why I developed uh, that accent. So which, par uh, which patients warrant a laparotomy? Maybe we'll give you a chance to write something in the chat. Okay, so you have chosen one of the worst words that are in the English language, unstable. So we don't like to use, say, use the word stable. A patient is either hemodynamically normal or hemodynamically abnormal. So I'm guessing you decided for hemodynamically abnormal. The most stable patient in a hospital is a dead patient. His blood pressure and pulse do not change. They don't go up, they don't go down. Okay, hypotensive, positive fast, yes. Abnormal hemodynamic, evisceration, perfect. Unresponder, which means he's hemodynamically abnormal despite uh, resuscitation. Great, I think you're all on top of it. Uh, I think this makes my job much easier. So let's see, since all of you know the indications for the OR, now you'll tell me what, how to manage this case. So I have a 30-year-old pedestrian hit by car. In the scene, the paramedics tell you there was no blood on the scene, so you're not expecting major blood loss in the scene. However, the patient is hypotensive. So somebody wrote ABC, great. So this is your ABCs. On primary survey, C collar is on. The patient is talking, which means his airway is patent. Normal chest expansion, normal air entry. Now on C, this is what you see in the abdomen, and that's the umbilicus. I hope the picture is clear. His blood pressure is 80 over 40. His tachycardic, tachypnic. The abdomen is bruised and tender. Wow, you guys are really ahead of me. Activate massive transfusion protocol. Great. Great. Ruqayya shahri. Yeah, I wonder who taught you that. So action. As you mentioned, two large bore IVs, sent for blood, cross match, complete blood count, coagulation profile. Uh, initially, we used to pump them with a lot of uh, saline water. Now, the most recent recommendation is one liter of warm, normal saline, and then we assess. 100% oxygen is given. So, let's see what's happening with this patient. So, GCS is 15, normal pupillary response and on exposure it's normal. Chest x-ray is normal, pelvis x-ray is normal, fast is positive. Yeah, so OR, laparotomy, laparotomy, wow. Everybody wants to take him for laparotomy. So we saw something abnormal, which was that he's hypotensive tachycardic. You gave him fluid. Do you wanna see what his blood pressure is like after the fluid? Yeah. Great, let's see. So on secondary survey, swollen left lower limb, basically the tibia looks like it might be injured. Blood pressure is now 110 over 70. Heart rate is 105. 
Okay, so now people want to take him to the CT scan. Good. So just remember that whenever you do an intervention, really be in the habit of reassessing your patient. It's good that you have a plan that you might want to go to the operating room, but now you all want to irradiate it. So this is your CT scan. And anyone sees anything? Great. Splenic injury, splenic, 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 splenic. Good. So you have detected the splenic injury. What is important also to ask to the radiologist is, in addition to you detecting the splenic injury, you want to confirm is there extravasation of the contrast? Yes. Because if the patient remains hemodynamically normal and there is extravasation of the contrast, what would you do? You would take him for angioembolization. And if you don't have the facility of angioembolization, but you have extravasation, then you need to take him to the OR because extravasation means bleeding. So you need to take them to the operating room. Great. Great. So indications for laparotomy, you kind of gone through it. They're hemodynamically abnormal with suspected abdominal injury. Of course, if you see free air, diaphragmatic rupture, peritonitis. And let's say the splenic injury was hemodynamically normal and you decided to manage them non-operatively. You keep them under observation. However, you notice that the requirement of transfusions over 24 hour is more than six units. You might consider taking them to the operating room. Okay. Other injuries like diaphragmatic injuries, as I mentioned, bladder rupture, mesenteric tear, all of these require a laparotomy. Great. Ready for another one? Good, good. Nice to see the interaction there. So 20, 20 year old male, you'll notice there's a pattern that most of my trauma patients, is this webinar can be attended outside of Oman? I think it can. Uh, so a 20 year old male stabbed in the anterior abdomen. The patient on examination is obese. He's hemodynamically normal. And this is the stab, which is just below the umbilicus. It's really not that bigger of a stab. It's about two to three centimeters in laceration. And you can see it's not really bleeding out. Yeah, well, I just told you his ABCs were uh, okay. He's hemodynamically normal. So some people wanna do fast, but he's hemodynamically normal. So do you want to do fast in a hemodynamically normal? Someone wants to do laparoscopy. Okay. And there is CT. Whoa. Okay, I can't keep up. There's CT, CT, CT. There was local wound exploration. Great. Well, somebody decided to take him to CT. Not what I would have done, but it is not completely wrong. You have the luxury of time. He's hemodynamically normal you might want to see the trajectory of that knife. Well, this is the CT scan, and you can see the big arrow pointing to a hematoma anterior to the rectus sheath. Other than that, there is no free air, and there is no free fluid. No, there is no free air, there is no free fluid. That, uh, this uh, that you might be seeing is actually in a bowel loop. So, People are saying rectus sheath is intact. As I said, bowel injury, well, not from the CT scan. There is no free air, no free fluid. Admit and wound exploration. Okay. So these are your options. Observe, laparotomy, laparoscopy. You could do wound exploration. However, remember I told you that the patient is obese. That means your wound exploration, you will really have to you need to extend the wound. When we say wound exploration, it means you do not poke the wound. You have to extend the wound and go layer by layer following the tract and seeing it. He's obese. 
people are saying observe, which is valid for anterior abdominal injuries. However, it depends how many stabbings do you get. I'm assuming in Kuwait you're not getting that many stabs, so you might want to figure him out more. If you're in South Africa and you're getting a stab every half an hour, you can't be taking people to the operating room for laparoscopy or laparotomy. So my preference in my center is, in this case, considering the body habitus, is to take the patient for laparoscopy. And this is what was done. Took him for laparoscopy and after encephalation of the abdomen, you notice that the bowel is actually poking into the wound. This is the peritoneal cavity. This is the peritoneum covering the anterior abdominal wall and there is a hole and the bowel is poking in. However, no spillage, nothing. What do you want to do? If he's thin, can you go with the observation? Well, you could, for me, if he's thin, what I would do is I would explore the wound. And however, the CT scan tells me that the, there is a hematoma in the rectus sheath. So wound exploration is only good enough to tell you is the rectus sheath involved or not. If the rectus sheath is involved, then you can't tell anything more. So the CT scan answered me. So wound exploration doesn't tell me much, but I can do serial abdominal exams if, uh, if I'd like to. This gives me an answer. So what do you want to do? So reduce and inspect. So reduce and inspect what? The bowel? Hernia repair. Okay, so definitely you want to reduce, but the main question that you need to answer by the laparoscopy is, is the peritoneum intact or has it been violated? You can tell from the picture that the peritoneum has been violated. That is the only question I usually like to ask. Because if the peritoneum is violated, that means there is a chance of intraperitoneal injury. If the peritoneum is intact, I can just stop the procedure there, take the CR2 out, wake the patient, and I can even send him home the same day without the need for observation because I know that the peritoneum is intact. However, when the peritoneum is violated, there is a chance of intraperitoneal injury. Running the bowel laparoscopy really is not my forte. The injuries with the bowels from a stab injury can be very small, and you can miss them on laparoscopy. If you're an amazing laparoscopist, go for it. For me, I would convert to laparotomy, and I would do an official running of the bowel. And this is what was done. And as you can see, the hole is not that big, and really it is the mucosa puckering through. And when you have a hole in a bowel, always be sure to examine the other side. And this, this is part of the challenges of laparoscopy. For me, the, the laparoscopy just answers, is the peritoneum violated or not? If it's not violated, you stop the procedure, wake the patient, and send them home. So which patients warrant a laparotomy in penetrating trauma? Of course, as with the blunt abdominal injury, hemodynamically abnormal, uh, free air, peritonitis, uh, evisceration. Yes, in that bowel, uh, primary pair is possible. And uh, the, uh, the, another reason uh, for you to do a laparotomy is actually to close the abdominal wall because otherwise you're going to end up with an incisional hernia. Gunshot wounds are a very different strategy and you should think of early uh, OR. Uh, there is more and more uh, literature now about non-operative management for right upper quadrant gunshot injuries. Again, you really need to know what is your population, what was that uh, weapon used. And uh, remember, whenever you say, I'm going to take a risk, you're not the one taking a risk. It's the patient that is taking the risk. So yeah, coming back, so indications for laparoscopy, sorry, going back because this was asked earlier. So indications for laparoscopy is when the patient seems pretty fine, but you're suspecting an intra-abdominal injury, they're hemodynamically normal. Stabs, it's really useful for especially anterior abdominal stabs. It does not have a role in retroperitoneal 
stab wounds. Uh, with abdominal gunshots, if you suspect that maybe it had skimmed the subcutaneous uh, tissue and did not penetrate the peritoneum, especially like I described in shotguns, when you have multiple pellets, but they're from far away, and you might think that all of the pellets are in the abdominal wall and have not penetrated the peritoneum, it does not hurt to put a camera and see if the peritoneum is intact. It is very useful now for the diagnosis and the repair of diaphragmatic injury. And we know that most of the modalities are not really great for diagnosing diaphragmatic injuries. Um, contraindications, and this is really important, do not, do not use laparoscopy in hemodynamic abnormal patients. Patients who have a very clear indication for laparotomy, like an eviscerated bowel, I don't know how you're gonna encephalate the abdomen anyway. Uh, as I mentioned, retroperitoneal injuries, and of course, if you do not know what you're doing. When do you think that there is a diaphragmatic injury? Well, it depends on the mechanism of injury. So thoracoabdominal stab wounds, thoracoabdominal gunshots, these are uh, the things that might trigger. If you take a chest X-ray and you notice that there is haziness in the in the lower chest, and especially, of course, if you put a nasal or orogastric tube and you see the tube going into the chest, uh, when you put a chest uh, tube and you are draining bowel contents, all of these things might give you an idea that they might be a diaphragmatic injury. So since I was told that senior residents were the ones this talk was uh, targeted to, I thought that I'm sure Dr. Hani gave you a, a good background about the ABCs. I did not want to go through that. I wanted to specifically talk about the abdominal trauma and the pattern of injury, the mechanisms of injury, the workup. But at the end of the day, we are surgeons and we have to do what we do best and that is operate. Now, unfortunately, trauma is becoming more and more non-operative, but we have to be trained for when that patient needs the, the OR, we need to put ourselves in the mind frame of what needs to be done. And one of the most important ornaments uh, in our hands is the crash laparotomy. I know we do a lot of uh, elective laparotomy, and unfortunately for you young people, you are more and more laparoscopist, but there will come a day where big surgeon means big incision. And you need to get into that abdomen quickly and do it methodically as fast as possible and get out of there as fast as possible. So I will just spend a few slides talking about what to do when your patient is crashing and needs a crash laparotomy. So we'll talk about access exposure. And the whole idea is first stop bleeding, control contamination. So you do a temporary bleeding control, you explore, and then you need to make a decision. Am I gonna stay and play? That means definitive repair of all the injuries that are there. Or am I going for damage control and I'm getting, fixing what I need to be fixed and getting the patient to the intensive care unit as soon as possible. So how do we do a crash laparotomy? Even before putting the incision, how do we position the patient? And what do we prep and drape? Anything on the chat or did I lose you all? Great, supine with the arms out and we prep. Nope, so from the nipples to the thigh. We prep really from the chin to the mid thigh because you might need to enter the chest. So you need to be ready a laparotomy might need to be extended into the chest. Your patient might crash and you might need to crack the chest open. You might discover, you might do a pericardial window and discover that the patient needs a sternotomy. So patient is supine with the arms out and you need to prep them from the chin all the way to the mid thigh. Uh, especially also in these days where ORs are becoming more and more hybrid, that means you might operate and you might do an on-table angiography and therefore prepping the thigh is great for access for angiography. So 
we enter the belly with three sweeps of the knife. This is not the, uh, the abdomen that you want to use the cautery with the cutting, then the coag and taking it. You really are going to be holding the, uh, the scalpel like a violinist and going for three sweeps, going through the skin and subcutaneous tissue, through the uh, linea alba, you'll see the peritoneum and you enter the peritoneum with your finger. Quick, quick, quick. Now people say, next, pack, the, uh, pack, pack, pack. You cannot pack an abdomen with the bowel there. It is as if pushing tissue into a bowl of soup. You will not be able to pack the abdomen. You really need to eviscerate the bowel early. Stick your hands in there, get all the bowel that you can out of your way. Then you start empirical packing. And I'm talking really here with blunt abdominal injury. Because with penetrating trauma, you tend to go to the area of the penetration. But with blunt, the bleeding could be coming from anywhere. And as we mentioned, the commonest organs to be injured in blunt are the spleen and the liver. So you start in the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and you go methodically in all the quadrants. Now, packing is not as simple as people think. It is not just shoving, uh, you know, lap pads into the abdomen. The idea is to sandwich these organs. So you need to pack above the liver and you need to pack below the liver so you can sandwich it. Same thing about the spleen. You need to pack above it and you need to pack below it. Because if you just keep pushing it, there is no counter pressure and you will not be able to stop bleeding that way. Once you've packed, now it will not stop major arterial bleeding, but it buys you time, especially with solid organs. And this is the time to ask the anesthetist to catch up with the resuscitation. Now, if your patient is not responding despite the packing and he's quite low, this might be the time for you to compress the abdominal aorta. And there are multiple ways to get to the uh, supraciliac aorta or the su suprarenal aorta. I usually mobilize the left lobe of the liver and go directly. The idea is not to clamp, it is just to apply pressure. Find a very strong medical student and take his hand and put it on the aorta. They love doing that and they can do that for hours. Another way is going through the lesser, uh, the lesser omentum between the stomach and the liver and going directly down and onto the aorta. Do not try to clamp things, you're just going to be injuring other organs. Once the anesthetist has caught up with the resuscitation, now you can explore your battlefield. And when you lift the transverse colon, the transverse mesocolon divides your abdomen right in the middle. You have the supra mesocolic and the infra mesocolic. The supra mesocolic you can examine the liver, the stomach, and the spleen. The inframesocolic basically is the small bowel and the pelvic organs. You have to examine the bowel, run the bowel from the GE junction all the way to the rectum, and you have to do it methodically. And you really need to lift the bowel, you need to examine it on both sides, and you need to look not just at the bowel, you need to look all the way at the mesentery going to the root of the mesentery. Take your time, go through it. Penetrating injuries especially because you might only see a drop of blood. Have with you a wet sponge and wipe the bowel if there is blood on it because you don't want to have a missed injury. Blunt hollow viscous injuries tend to be bigger than with penetrating. So as I said, explore the supramesocolic and the inframesocolic. Whatever way you do it, you can start from the right to the left, just have a systematic way of examining your patient and make sure that you do it the same way every time. If you decide to explore it this way on Sunday and this way a different way on Monday, I guarantee you, you'll miss injuries. Once you've examined all of the peritoneal cavity, you also want to open the lesser sac and you'll be able to examine the posterior aspect of the stomach and the superior aspect of the pancreas. Now you've finished exploring the peritoneal cavity. You want to keep the retroperitoneal exploration targeted and limited, especially 
in blunt injury. You don't want to be going blindly into a retroperitoneal hematoma. You need to, uh, in blunt injuries, we have what's called zones, which is one, two, three, and you can review it later. We only explore expanding hematomas, pulsatile hematomas in zone one. Those are the ones that we need to explore. Uh, the ones in two and three is, as I mentioned, if they are indication suspicious of vascular injury. Most of the time, those hematomas will settle. Going into them blindly will cause more bleeding. With penetrating, that dictum does not work. Any hematoma really ideally should be explored. However, consider proximal and distal control before entering the hematoma. So how do I explore the retroperitoneum? Well, there is the Mattox maneuver, or it's called the left medial visceral rotation maneuver. And uh, basically, it is like doing a left hemicolectomy. And people say, well, I'm rushing, this takes time. The idea is really, if there is a retroperitoneal hematoma, it does most of the dissection for you. And we do not use the cautery to open up the peritoneum. It's actually lifted up and you can go bluntly first with your finger and you can take the METs and slide the METs in the avascular plane as you go. This, with the Matex maneuver, you'll be able to go and lift the left colon. You'll be able to visualize really on the left side, uh, the aorta, both the suprarenal and the infrarenal aorta. What about the left, uh, the right side? Well, on the right side, you do a right medial, uh, right-sided medial visceral rotation. And it's really in three stages. You need to cocorize the duodenum. You need to, again, mobilize the, the, uh, the uh, sorry, the ascending colon, the right-sided colon. And then you extend it all the way to the ligament of trites. This is basically the Cattell brash maneuver. And it really exposes to you all the way from the CBD to the ligament of trites, you will be able to see the infrarenal and the suprarenal uh, IVC. Be careful with bleeding at the root uh, of the mesentery. It really can be a trap. People usually like to take big stitches there. At the root of the mesentery, you, you might take a stitch into the superior mesenteric artery and therefore lose all of your bowel. My advice is to go with your finger and thumb at the, roof, uh, at the root of the mesentery, compress it, and then open up the serosa of the mesentery and examine the area. Most commonly, there's bleeders from the super, uh, superior mesenteric vein side, which you could ideally repair as opposed to like it. Uh, Of course, I want to bring to your attention also where injuries might be missed, especially when we're doing it fast. At the esophagogastric junction, you really need to pull the stomach down, look at the GE junction. The ligament of trites, you need to have your assistant lift the transverse colon way up there, and you need to start right at the beginning of where the duodenum, uh, the third and fourth part of the du duodenum, uh, exit the retroperitoneal uh, space. Uh, we tend to look at the bowel quickly, but injuries at the mesenteric border of the small bowel, especially with penetrating injuries, can be missed. Uh, posterior wall of the transverse colon, especially if we do not mobilize the omentum properly, it might be obscured. And of course, the extraperitoneal rectum. Open the lesser sac. Yes? Yes, the diaphragm is easy to examine because when you're pulling down the spleen, uh, after you've removed your pact systematically, you can pull down the spleen, compress it with your, uh, and press the stomach down, you'll be able to examine the left side of the diaphragm very clearly, which is the most common side of the diaphragm that you will need to repair. Right-sided diaphragmatic injuries, not that common. The, the liver tends to protect it. And even when there is a tear, the liver tends to buttress it. Always remember that uh, in damage control mode, your idea is not to do definitive repair. It is damage control. You just want to stop bleeding, control contamination. So you don't need to do anything fancy. 
continuity of the bowel is not your priority right now, do not please try to start doing stomas for uh, polytrauma patients. What you can do is you can use an umbilical tape and go right under the bowel and tie it off as if you're tying off a blood vessel. You don't even need to waste time trying to excise that piece of bowel at the current time. Or if you have staplers, you can just staple that piece of bowel out of your way. <clears throat> now I've talked about the abdominal injuries and I hope I'm okay with time. Uh, I wanted to speak about I wanted to speak about pelvic fractures, and I wanted to bring to your attention that it takes a significant amount of force to break the pelvis. And therefore, 30% of them are associated with intra-abdominal injuries. Please do not take pelvic fractures lightly. Pelvic fractures are not an orthopedic problem until you have made sure that there is no intra-abdominal injury. Also, the pelvis itself, in addition to bleeding from intra-abdominal organs, the pelvis itself, when you disrupt the ring, can be a major source of bleeding, venous or arterial. So how do we assess pelvic fractures? Well, again, look, feel, and listen. Well, there isn't much listening in the pelvis, except if you're looking for the click, and I hope you're not looking for the listening for the click. With inspection, you would see that there is limb discrepancy. The patient might be having his foot in external rotation, might be open or closed pelvic fracture. Of course, any pelvic tenderness is a pelvic fracture until proven otherwise. We really do not recommend this whole compression business anteriorly and laterally. Gentle palpation is enough, and we advise the use of a pelvic x-ray really when you're suspecting. Of course, we used to force everybody to do a digital rectal exam on polytrauma patients. You still have to do it. But we used to talk about high riding prostate in patients with pelvic fractures. Now, in all my years of practice, I have not palpated a high riding prostate. Now, that might be one of the downside of having a very long finger, maybe. But the new ATLS basically asks, does not ask you to feel for a high riding prostate, but a digital rectal exam is important, especially with a, a fresh glove, to make sure that there is no blood in the rectum that might suggest the conversion of a pelvic fracture into an open pelvic fracture. So how do we manage it? Well, as you said, ABC. And of course, the problem with pelvis in the primary survey is the C, controlling the hemorrhage and our priority is a wrap. Now, these are fancy wraps uh, that you can see, but in the lower picture, as you can see, even a, a regular sheet can be used, and sometimes it's even more efficient than these fancy pelvic binders. You need to rule out uh, abdominal hemorrhage, as I said, and then the, the issue is how do you fix it? Now, orthopedics can do uh, an external fixator, they can do uh, definitive repair, uh, but you need to make sure that the patient is not bleeding, and bleeding really is tackled very well with angiography, especially in patients who are hemodynamically normal or responding to resuscitation. Those who are not hemodynamically normal, those are unfortunately the patients that you have to go to the operating room and think of preperitoneal packing. So this is what I was just talking about, a hemodynamically abnormal patient with a pelvic fracture. You want to know, is there an intra-abdominal injury or not? Or is it just purely that he's hemodynamically abnormal because of the pelvis? You do the FAST. If the FAST is positive, this patient goes to the operating room for a laparotomy, and you also do periperitoneal packing. Uh, if the FAST is negative, then basically it's from the pelvis. If you have angio facility and you can keep up with the resuscitation, angiography would be your place to go. If not, then you go for preperitoneal packing and then try to go for angio after your preperitoneal packing. What are the pitfalls? Well, delayed intervention for abdominal or pelvic hemorrhage uh, is uh, an issue. Uh, in trauma, really, your idea, you need to change your mindset from trying to find excuses of why the patient is behaving that way and that you want to go for the conservative, your job is to detect the injuries. 
not to make excuses for the injuries that it might be something else. Uh, as I mentioned, retroperitoneal injuries might be very difficult to detect just by physical examination alone or with uh, a BPL or even with a FAST. You need a CT scanner, you need to have that high suspicion, you might need to do an apotomy. Uh, the back, and as I mentioned, it's not the back, it's the posterior abdomen, posterior thoracoabdominal area, or posterior chest. Patients who have spinal cord injury or altered sensorium from drug or alcohol might not be the best patients to assess. Even patients who have a GCS of 15 and have no distracting injuries and have only blood in their abdomen, in their peritoneal cavity, 30% of those patients you might miss with abdominal examination alone. Great. So in summary to my talk, you know, the abdomen, there is three distinct re regions. There's the peritoneal cavity, there's the retroperitoneal space, and really there's the pelvic cavity. You really have to have a high suspicion of what this patient's injuries might be. As they say, what the mind doesn't know, the eye doesn't see. So really, if you know the mechanism of injury, you might have an idea. Deceleration injuries are very different than penetrating injuries from blast injuries, as we mentioned. Early surgical consultation is very important. If you do not have surgical capabilities in your hospital, early transfer is what you should be thinking of. An appropriate diagnostic procedure should be depending on what your suspicion is. A plain CT scan does not answer you. A, a contrast CT scan might not give you all the answers you're looking for. So you really need to guide your radiologist, help him to answer the questions that you want answered. So that was my talk. Uh, I have a few MCQs that uh, I have also given to the organizers. Uh, so yeah, okay, they're presented here. So the first MCQ, it's a 25 year old male involved in a motor vehicle collision brought to the emergency department. CT scan shows that he has a thoracic aortic injury. And basically most of the aortic injuries tend to be at the ligament of, not ligament of trites, but at the ligamentum arteriosum after the takeoff of the left subclavian. And he also has a splenic laceration with free intraperitoneal fluid. Now he was hemodynamically normal. He dropped his blood pressure after the CT scan and you resuscitate, but the blood pressure is 65 millimeters mercury. So where sh what should you do? Should we give them like 30 seconds to answer and then we'll call We're currently uh, wait. I'm waiting for everyone to answer, doctor. Great. Uh, around Great. 100 over 270, so just give them a few seconds. Yeah, yeah uh, I we think we're doing uh, well for time, so. Yeah, we, we have also two questions in the chats, one from Dr. Badr Shaban and uh, another question from Dr. Badr Saleh. Uh, feel free to answer them whenever you want. Okay, so I'll answer them right after this MCQ so people will also have a chance to, to hear. It's a very good question from Dr. Badr. In an answer, is a... We have 57 57 uh, percent of the voters just wait give them a few seconds more sure oops all right, we can share them now. So, what are the answers? I'll share it now. Explorative laparotomy. Metagdeen, you don't want to fix the aorta? There are endoaortic injury, any? Call the vascular surgeon, transfer him, get him out of there. No, all of you are, 73% of you are correct. Explorative laparotomy. 
the reason I put this question is because people always think of the aorta. And uh, the aorta, really, there's two patterns. There's free rupture and there's contained rupture. With the free rupture, it is five heartbeats and the patient is dead. You can't do anything about it. Most of the ones you will be seeing, if not all, of the thoracic aortic injuries that you will be seeing are those that are, have a pseudoaneurysm. It is waiting to rupture. And basically, in those patients, uh, they will be mostly hemodynamically normal. And therefore, do not say that you're thinking of hemodynamic abnormality with thoracic aortic injury. With thoracic aortic injury, you really need to have the suspicion and you need to go looking for it, okay? So in this patient, your best bet of saving him if he drops his blood pressure is opening the abdomen and probably it's the spleen and doing a splenectomy, great. Uh, okay, before we do the next uh, MCQ, uh, I thought maybe I'd answer Dr. Bedder's uh, uh, question. So it says, uh, do you have a characteristic pelvic x-ray fracture pattern? For example, open book, butterfly segment, sacroiliac disconnection that might push you directly to angio. So um, it's a very good question. We, we see the open book, as you mentioned. There is also the lateral compression. After doing the A, B, and C, and part of the C is really wrapping the pelvis, we wrap most of our pelvises. However, really the ones that do make a difference, the wrap is the open book pelvic fracture. That is the one that you bring back the ring together. With the lateral compression, do not have a high expectation of improvement. However, if anything, it reduces the amount of movement. But it will not improve his hemodynamics as much as an open book pelvic fracture. All of these patterns can be associated with intra-abdominal injury, so you can have bleeding from the intra-abdomen and you can have from the pelvis. However, the open book pelvic fracture and the lateral shear are the ones with the interruption of the sacroiliac joint that might have more bleeding, whether it's venous or arterial. Now, the angiography really tackles the arterial pelvic bleeding. So what we do, if the patient is hemodynamically normal or we can resuscitate him, we will do a CT, you know, the pan CTs. And on the pan CTs, you will see extravasation. And then we can go to angio. If you don't see extravasation of the IV contrast on the CT scan, then angio is not going to, you won't have anything to angio embolize. I hope I answered that. It's a little bit of a big topic, but I hope I kind of covered that. Should we do the next MCQ? Then I'll answer further questions. So this one, as you can see, a 32-year-old male is brought to the emergency department post-motor vehicle collision with the following vital signs. He's hypotensive, tachycardic, the GCS is 10, the patient moans when the pelvis is palpated. After initial fluid resuscitation, the next step in management is and I kind of gave you a clue to it, so that is not fair. I think Better ruined it for, for this MCQ, but thanks, Better, for the question. So we'll, we'll give them a few seconds. Sure. Everyone is answering very fast. Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> These yes. Okay, so uh, pelvic x-ray is not completely wrong. However, placement of a pelvic binder takes precedence to me before the, uh, getting the pelvic x-ray. I don't need to confirm a pelvic fracture before putting a binder. I can put a binder on, get the x-ray, and if the x-ray doesn't suggest any pelvic fracture, I can always take the binder off. However, remember, he's hemodynamically abnormal. So my idea is, you know, the treatment of bleeding is, let me see it on the chat. What's the treatment of bleeding? And I don't want my ex-residents answering, and neither should Dr. Salman al-Sabah answer this. The treatment of bleeding, great. Nobody said uh, blood or IV fluids. 
Good. So treatment of bleeding is stop the bleeding. It's not rocket science. It's find the hole, plug, plug the hole, then you fill the tank. And this is what's happening in this patient is hemodynamically abnormal. So you want to stop the bleeding. And the, fr the first thing that would stop it is placement or reducing it is placement of the pelvic binder. Then you can confirm it with your adjuncts. You can give the fluids. You can do all of the other stuff. So the answer of pl uh, placement of pelvic binder is the correct one. And before we do the next MCQ, oh, somebody wrote IV fluids. La, la, la. So stop the bleeding. Uh, let me answer the, the question that's in the chat. Uh, sorry, it says in an unstable polytrauma patient with concomitant, big words, intra-abdominal injury with a pelvic fracture uh, that requires a laparotomy. If you see an expanding pelvic hematoma, do you do intraperitoneal packing or do you try to enter the preperitoneal space and perform preperitoneal packing? Uh, Preperitoneal packing is superior to intraperitoneal packing. Remember when I was saying for packing to work, you need to, to be able to compress the bleeder. You need to have packing from above and packing from below. If the bleeder is below the peritoneum and you're only packing from above, the pack cannot stay there it, the, uh, unless you fill the whole peritoneal cavity with the uh, packs. I mean, that's... Uh, the patient's going to die from suffocation. Yeah, I mean, the diaphragm is going to go all the way into his uh, clavicle. So by opening the peritoneum, you're going between the pelvis and the peritoneum, going all the way, and really you need to go all the way down. It's like doing the, uh, uh, the lymph node dissection uh, at, the, uh, at the bifurcation of uh, the common... Uh, common iliac. Really, you need to go all the way down to the pelvic brim and pack. Therefore, you have a peritoneum, you have a pack, and then you have the actual pelvic floor. And that will compress. So I usually prefer a preperitoneal packing. And not only that, as soon as I've resuscitated, I've stopped that. I hope that my angio facility is ready. Either they do it in the OR, if I have a hybrid OR, or I take them to the angio suite and have it done there. Do not be very comfortable that your pack has done it all. If you don't have angio capabilities, well, you've done as much as you can for now. And the next MCQ. Okay, uh, Dr. Abdullah, we have noticed that uh, we have a special guest with us who have been attending all, all the whole lecture. Uh, it's Dr. Salman Sabah. Uh, Dr. Salman is the chairman of the Kuwait Association of uh, Surgeon, and he's the depart head department of surgery of uh, the Jabal Hospital. Dr. Salman, do you hear me? You're with yes, us? Yes, I hear you, yeah. Dr. Mohammed. Thank you for, for the introduction. Dr. Abdullah, uh, first of all, uh, I'm very happy to see you. And uh, alhamdulillah, you look great as usual. And thank you again for uh, this kind of uh, uh, presentation. And I was like, looking at some of your slides and, and I think it's still useful for me as well. So I think uh, we learned a lot from you and we really appreciate all your support, not only in this webinar, but also in the previous uh, uh, education uh, lectures that you uh, presented here in Kuwait and around the world. Uh, we, it's always a pleasure to have you and it's always uh, nice to see you. And uh, we really, uh, inshallah, we can see you in a better uh, situation out of this crisis and all our, our friends in Oman, inshallah. And again, uh, I just came in just to say thank you very much for supporting us and supporting the surgical community and be safe. And, uh, and this is for everybody. And uh, we look forward for more collaboration, inshallah, in the future. Allah khalik, Salman. Thank you very much. It's so good to see you. You look great. By the way, Salman has to say good stuff about me because I was his senior resident. So. Right. You know, That's why I'm st I still learn from you. <laughs> no, I, uh, I think, I mean, uh, I mean as, as, as always, a uh, great lecture, and uh, we still learn from you, and uh, we look forward to have even more collaboration. And I'm sorry to disturb your lecture. I think uh, uh, you have more questions, and uh, be safe, inshallah.
تسلم الله يخليك ثانك يو ثانك يو سلمان ثانك يو جريت سو ذا ثيرد كويستشن هيموداينامكلي نورمال 10 يير اولد جيرل از هوسبيتاليز فور اوبزرفيشن افتر ا جريت 3 سبلينيك انجري has been confirmed by CT scan. Which of the following mandates an immediate laparotomy? Now, somebody, I remember I was, uh, when I showed the CT scan of the splenic injury and I was saying, what question should we be asking the radiologist? Really, I'm looking for extravasation of contrast. The grading doesn't really change my management that much, uh, and I will explain why. Grading is important for us retrospectively, when we want to see the results. But really between two and three and, you know, it really doesn't make much of an, that is not a determining factor, major, major determining factor. It has a role, but not a major role. And uh, I will answer, I guess, the role of Splino Rafi when I, when you guys have finished this MCQ. I think we can share them now. Share okay, them. great. Fast. Uh, development of peritonitis on physical examination. Exactly. That is the, really what mandates a laparotomy. Evidence of a retroperitoneal hematoma on a CT scan. Well, remember, this is a blunt abdominal injury. And if there is no extravasation of contrast and it is not in zone one, we could monitor this patient. There is no need to take her to the OR uh, for that. Uh, penetrating injury is very different. Of course, if it was a penetrating injury, with a retroperitoneal hematoma, these patients you should be taking to the operating room. Uh, a fall of hemoglobin, which a lot of people mistake, you know, because, well, she dropped her hemoglobin from 12 to 8. As I said, that by itself is not an indication to go to the operating room. The hemodynamic status of the patient really is more of a determinant factor than the drop of the hemoglobin. As I mentioned, the first hemoglobin you get really doesn't represent much because if I, you know, for example, cut your femoral artery and I let you bleed out right in front of me, and if I was a psychopath, Yanni, uh, with a medical degree, uh, basically I would let you bleed out. And if I took that last drop of blood in your body and I sent it to the laboratory for a hemoglobin test, what would your hemoglobin be? Uh, I hope somebody answered, but it would be normal because hemoglobin is concentration. And when you bleed out, you don't bleed out just red blood cells, you bleed out whole blood. And therefore, the initial hemoglobin is not reflective. The next hemoglobin is eight. The question is, where is this heading? And in addition to that, the hemodynamic status of the patient. Since I'm talking about splenic injury, I'll talk about the role of splenorraphy. And we don't do much of splenography because of the non-operative management of spleen. In the days where all abdomens were open and you would see a splenic injury that was not a major splenic injury, you can repair the spleen. But most of those spleens did not even require any repair. They would have stopped bleeding on their own. And that is where the role of non-operative management has played. In addition to that, now we have the NGO embolization part of our armor. Now, if I'm going into the abdomen because of a diaphragmatic injury, for example, and I'm repairing the diaphragm, and I notice the splenic injury, whether it was there before or whether because of my large hands while mobilizing the spleen, I've injured the spleen, I can attempt a splenography. In a hemodynamically abnormal patient that you go into the abdomen and it's because of the spleen, don't waste your time fixing the spleen. Take the spleen out, put it in the bucket. That is what I do. That is in general. Of course, you need to take it case by case, maybe one in a thousand, I would try to attempt to fix the spleen. Okay. So, uh, generalized abdominal pain following rupture of a hollow organ is most likely suggested off, and this is really for the medical students in case they were here or uh, basically junior residents. What do you guys think? What causes generalized abdominal pain?
I would have thought they answered this one pretty quick. Hamid? I'm just waiting for a few of them. Okay. Yes, we can share them now. Sure. And yes, it is diffuse peritoneal contamination. And the reason I put this question is just to let you know that you can have free air in the peritoneum without abdominal pain and without abdominal signs. And as I said, you can have blood in the peritoneum. In 30% of the cases, they might not have abdominal signs. So uh, usually abdominal pain with, peritoneal, with peritonitis, this patient has really diffuse peritoneal contamination and it is not something to be ignored. And Again, I really want to emphasize, realize the limitation of your physical examination. You might miss free air. You might miss uh, blood in the peritoneum with just pure physical examination alone. And that's why the adjuncts are there to help you out. Uh, one question that is there by Dr. Khawla Al-Harrasi, in a patient that's hemodynamically abnormal, Fast is negative features of severe traumatic abdominal injury. Will you still take him for laparotomy? Although high negative laparotomy role, I mean. Okay, well, he's hemodynamically abnormal, doctora. And really, my job as a surgeon is to make sure that there is no hemorrhagic shock in this patient. So you use the dictum of where is that blood? Of close blood on the floor, you would detect it. Long bones and pelvic injuries, very easy to detect. Chest x-ray would tell me if there is blood in the uh, chest. Fast would tell me if there is tamponade. The thing that is there is either abdomen, intraperitoneal, or retroperitoneal. So yes, I might have a, a, with a negative fast a negative lap, uh, laparotomy, but when I go in and it's a negative laparotomy, I know that I have done everything that I can do as a surgeon. and the remaining thing for this patient is vasopressors. But assuming or making the assumption that, first of, first of all, that the FAST was the 100% sensitive, also making, uh, I don't know the status of the retroperitoneum, I think it is worth it in this patient that is dying in front of me, is to go in and absolutely tell the intensive care unit that he has no intra-abdominal or retroperitoneal injury, just in case he deteriorates even more, that they don't call me in the middle of the night to take him back to the OR because I have done the scan. I remember one of the surgeons used to tell me the best scan that we have is called a retinal scan. It's a three-dimensional scan. It is colored. It's your eyes and your hands. So don't assume, make sure that this patient does not have an injury. I hope uh, I was uh, not too uh, aggressive there. So, so I, think this is the, I think this is the last question, yeah? Okay. So when blood is released in the peritoneal cavity, blood pressure falls, uh, well, I'll let you read it because getting a sore throat. I'll just see if there are any other questions in the chat. Doctor, we have uh, uh, questions in the Q&A panel, if you want to check them. OK, well, I've answered most. The, the one I see now is, yeah, OK. There's another question from Vidr Dr. Vidr <sighs> Sure. Uh, sure. I'll, since this is the last MCQ, I'll, I'll answer it and then answer the Q&A. These are the results of the last poll, doctor. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, that's the right answer. Basically, non-specific signs. Really, as I mentioned, you can have blood in the peritoneal cavity without peritonitis. You, you know, uh, you lose usually a lot of blood before your systolic blood pressure drops, especially in young people who compensate. Therefore, I always say a hypotensive patient is the end of the road. The patient has tried to compensate as much as possible, and now he is just trying to die. So if you're waiting for your patient to become hypotensive, you've really waited too long to stop the bleeding. If he comes to you hypotensive, 
he's trying to die and your job is to stop him from dying. So yeah, nonspecific signs, good enough for me to know that there is a possible intra-abdominal injury. A uh, question from uh, Dr. Menard. Uh, basically, what is uh, your opinion using hemostatic agents as fibrillar, fibrillar powder in the pelvic vascular injury? Any benefit or harm? Well, I think I'm uh, an old school surgeon. I think uh, the treatment, as I said, of bleeding is to stop the bleeding. So I usually start by pressure and the pressure is with the packs, with your finger. Anything that I can ligate, I would ligate. Uh, this fancy stuff of fibrillar and stuff works very well for multiple lacerations in the, uh, for example, large surface area uh, on the liver. Uh, I would not do it for the spleen. Uh, as I said, if the spleen is my problem, I would take out the spleen. But really for liver, it is, uh, is where I would be using it and I would put it and then put a, a pack on top because you still need pressure for it. Uh, I do not find these hemostatic agents working on vascular injury because it says in pelvic vascular injury. Uh, really the, the treatment of vascular injury is either is ligating that vessel either from the outside with a stitch or with a compressing it or taking them for angiography and blocking the vessel from within. That's my humble ex yeah, any opinion. Uh, another question, uh, Mohammed, it might be way down. Yes, there is uh, another. Severe trauma. Yeah, so severe trauma, low GCS with severe trauma, low GCS with head bruise. Okay, uh, severe pelvic fracture, positive fast, hypotensive. Sounds like a very sick patient. You take to laparotomy. Blood is leaking, expanding pelvic hematoma. Can't know <laughs> whether it's from the pelvis or the brain injury causing ongoing hypotension. When do you give uh, precedence to brain uh, or prioritize CT, brain CT to determine role of neurosurgical intervention? Okay, well, that's a good question. Uh, there, these are the principles of trauma. So in brain injury, there's something called primary injury and secondary injury. Primary injury is your head hitting the steering wheel, the windshield. It's the frying pan that your wife used to hit you on the head with. It is stuff I cannot help you with. Our job as trauma surgeons or doctors is to prevent secondary brain injury. The way you can save this brain is by preventing secondary brain injury. And one of the, the things is that every episode of hypotension doubles the mortality of your brain injured patient. Therefore, before dealing with the brain, you need to stop the bleeding. And that is why it is A, B, C. So brain CT does not, is not a priority for me in a hypotensive patient. I take the patient, I stop the bleeding, it's an expanding pelvic hematoma, I pack the preperitoneal pack, I take him for CT angio, um, uh, sorry, for angioembolization. I don't need a CT because I was in the abdomen, I saw the peritoneum, I saw the retroperitoneum, and I know that there is a pelvic hematoma that's expanding that I need to stop. Preperitoneal packing, angioembolization. The CT brain happens when the patient becomes stabilized or normalized hemodynamically. If I don't control the hemodynamics, no neurosurgeon can save this brain. Even if they relieve the pressure on the brain, they cannot. And they will not take him to the operating room when, they are, when he's hemodynamically abnormal. So again, stop the bleeding, stop the bleeding, stop the bleeding. Then you get the fancy neurosurgeons taking their time, lifting the scalp, taking the uh, the cranium apart and relieving the pressure. If you don't stop the bleeding from the pelvis, you're not going to save the brain. Uh, should I answer the? Should I keep on answering the questions, Mohammed? Yes, yes. Feel free, doctor. Okay. Sure. I, I'm just worried about your time. That's all. No, no, we're good with time. Don't worry about it. Okay. So it says, I have a question, please. In which case can brain injury cause hypotension? 
in which case can brain injury lead to hypotension? Okay, so that's a very good question. So brain injury will never cause hypovolemic shock. Okay, it can cause hypotension. It will not cause hypovolemic shock. And that is why when we look at the spaces where you might have had blood loss, and that is basically the chest, the intraperitoneum, so the abdomen, the pelvis, the retroperitoneum, the long bones, uh, and of course, externally, these are the areas we look for brain, uh, so, sorry, for blood loss. Most people, and sorry, I'm being a bit facetious, but most people, their skull is not empty. It's filled with something. It's a brain. You, <laughs> blood loss in the cranium doesn't have that much room for expansion, so it will press on the brain. You will die from a herniated brain before you die from hypovolemic shock because of blood in the cranium. So if you are getting hypotension from a purely isolated brain injury, and it is not from a scalp bleeding to the outside, this brain has undergone severe trauma that there is no sympathetic outflow anymore. And this patient's mortality is very high, and you're not going to save him with your surgical interventions. Uh, doctor, I know you're busy, so I think it's better we can take one more question. There is one question in the Q&A. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's, uh, it's it said, uh, I have asked two questions in the Q&A. Yes. Is it the correct way to post a query? Uh, I yes. don't know which questions are. Which questions are those? Did I miss it? Yes, it's in the Q&A panel. Uh, if you can open it, it's just uh, uh, okay. on the top. Sorry, sorry. Again, as I said, old man, new technology. So, so that um, would be the last question, doctor. So I uh, feel free to. Sh should I answer this gentleman's question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in pediatric patients, quite often MVC presents with multifocal trauma. Yeah, so polytrauma, especially splenic and liver tears individually or together with the pelvic fractures and retroperitoneal hematoma in my Salala experience. What is your opinion and recommendation? Well, um, yes, um, children, uh, their abdominal wall is thin. Uh, they have uh, pliable bones. So even when you hit the thorax, uh, you don't have rib fractures. So don't be dependent to look for rib fractures on the chest x-ray. But uh, injury to the left upper quadrant or the thoracoabdominal area or the right upper quadrant in the thoracoabdominal area can lead to a splenic injury, a liver injury. How, how would I manage them? Just like we explained. So you do your ABCs and your secondary survey. If the patient is hemodynamically normal, you go for the CT scan and you see, you detect these injuries. If they're hemodynamically normal with no extravasation of contrast, then you can manage them non-operatively both the spleen and the liver. If, uh, if they are hemodynamically abnormal, despite resuscitation, therefore you need to take them to the operating room and manage them as I discussed. Um, should it, one more question or should we call it a day? Well, I'm not actually, uh, actually, doctor, we, I, we're, we're getting short with time. I'm so sorry our attendees, uh, uh, but uh, this lecture will be uh, provided on our website soon. And uh, yes, I, I would like to thank you, Dr. Abdullah, and I would like to thank you for being with us today. It has been an honor and uh, a privilege to have you on our platform and uh, hope to see you in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Abdullah. It, it, it was a wonderful and very informative lecture. Thank you all and stay safe and see you in Oman soon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.